This is the Go Maluku podcast. Yeah, so um, with um, what I realized that I don't know, like, like before recording some when I before I started recording a podcast and everything else, um, I also was very anxious. I'm like, all right, um, yeah, like, but if I'm going to say something, then it it, it is dead forever, you know. And then like, if 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 I ever have the uh, ambition to run for political office, not that I ha- do have any. Um, but it could be used against me or whatever. Um, so um, that fear was there for a while, and then it quickly, I changed my mindset on it, and and also gave myself permission by saying like, um, this is just, I just want to give myself permission to be wrong, as in as in, I just as a, this is a learning process. So I'm just learning in public. Um, so from uh, people that I know, people like yourself that I've known for a very long time, but actually, like, do you really know that person? Like, yeah. that's it's also uh, super interesting, yeah. and, and and about topics that I am, uh, people like myself, are deemed to know, um, but I'm actually don't know. Like, I, I uh, for example, indigenous knowledge is something that is it is, it's gaining interest rapidly. Uh, um, um, within within the UN, outside of the UN, and especially within the UN, like I'm, like, I'm, I'm, yeah, I know a lot about Indi- international law, Indi- indigenous rights, but when it comes to indigenous knowledge and like the 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 nuances between knowledge and, sci- and science, like I'm, 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 that's not my, not not necessarily my cup of tea. So, um, so I, I also, I'm also going to, um. They're lined up, uh, so some indigenous peoples that are, are very affluent, affluent in in science, uh, science, um, genomes, whatever, uh, and all these kind of things, which I want to learn because mm-hmm. at some point it, it might it might hit me um, uh, within the UN context. Like, all right, um, can you tell me something about this and that? Like, I don't want to say like, oh yeah, I don't know, or want to regurgitate all the 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 paragraphs of the declaration, which is important, but. You know, some at some point, like it, when that conversation shifts to mm-hmm. science or or knowledge, you know, it, 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 it's I I just feel that I'm um not capable of having a um I should say a um an intellect not an intellectual but a good conversation about it like being being able to um to know what I talk about so. Yeah, that's a just long-winded way of saying that. Uh, why I, why why I do the, record this podcast and 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 sit down with people like yourself. So thank you so much for 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 um, yeah, joining the the conversation. Actually, thank you. It's so fun, such a pleasure. Very yeah. Oh, pleasure is all mine. Like it is. Um, yeah, like I, like I said before, it is. I don't. You, you think I, at least I think I know people and the, the people that I lot, work a lot with, right? Um, and I think that's the, the the one of the upsides of of being at home, COVID nineteen, uh, quarantine, and everything else. Right. That yeah, it it everyone is at home, well, almost everyone. Mm-hmm. That we can uh, yeah just just um, yeah have a, have a conversation and, and really try to. Um, yeah, build relationships actually, as as in like know your friends. How how well do you know your friends and 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 f- the the people people that I've talked to recently? I'm like, wow, like there are things that about them that I didn't know and and probably wouldn't know if we weren't in this in this in this situation. But you know, it's what you want you have a conversation um, that's longer than 50 minutes. Like, yeah. Uh, right. like, <laughs> I mean, then, we've yeah. been around each other a lot, but you're right. Like, you know, how much do we know about each other? Exactly, right? We've been around each other a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With access, so, so this is also great for me because I would love to learn more about you and, you know, and engaging in this conversation. <laughs> so, and, yeah, and by all means. So, um, this is a this is not an in- interview. Um, this right. is a conversation, <laughs> and because two way street. Of, yeah, that definitely two way street. Uh, because first and foremost, I am. Uh, I suck at inter- interviewing. Um, uh, I am I'm, I'm fairly okay in in conversation. So um, so that's so um, so humble. Yeah. 
you're also very humble, it's I'll say. <laughs> For somebody like mm. you, you know, has some major successes at the global stage. <laughs> Very helpful. So, well, th thank, well, thanks. And maybe it is, uh, um, yeah, you have to be humble. Um, because there was a time that I was cocky um, at the international stage, that I was <laughs> um, wit and I was full of myself. Um, okay. So, and, and, I, uh, and I got, uh, how should I say it, like, like uh, put in my place uh, at some point. Mm. So, by, by by other people so which and which is a good thing um mm -hmm. because like if, if there, there, there's no 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 speed break then it can go like um above and beyond um so um i learned to be humble uh, and actually maybe it's, it, nowadays I like to look at it as like like self-awareness as in like being able to, all right, like, okay, Ghazali, um, you love to be good at this, but are you actually good at this? <laughs> um, so like asking yourself, I ask myself a lot of questions. Um, it is even questions that I don't like the answers to, but I do feel that I have to ask, the, the, ask myself those questions. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. You have like a, a, an active relationship with yourself. Yeah. Don't we all need something like that to be able to, uh, I don't know, to... Um... Yeah, yeah. We'll need it. I don't know to what extent all of us, I mean, of course, every one of us have, has it, right? But uh, I feel the depth of it, right? Right, yeah. It's different. Um, yeah. That is one thing I'm interested in, you know, how do we get to know ourselves and get to know others? Mm -hmm. Just human beings and and what do you think because for, for me like when it when it comes to like trying to it's it's like a discovery right i'm um, just uh, asking yourself questions and at least that, that's that was that is my mode of like how, how, how i did things just ask myself some questions um to yeah get to know me and get to know people um other people um strangely um, it is also partly that, um, I didn't know myself actually for mm -hmm. at least I know myself better right now than I used to know myself before. Mm -hmm. Um, and by extension, um, I also started to be interested in how well I knew the people that I knew, mm -hmm. like if I don't even know myself that well. Mm -hmm. um, chances are that um, I don't know my friends that well or people that I work a lot, my, my colleagues that well. Mm -hmm. you know, so it is, it is I, I don't know, it's, it's a fascinating journey um, and that, um, I don't know, discovery journey or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. It's, mm -hmm. um, yeah, how, how do you look at it? As in, is it the, the, the process? Um, you know, it's interesting because, um, I grew up in Bulgaria, which is a common, was a communist country when I was growing up. And so the idea of the collective is very important. And then I moved to the U S as a teenager, where the idea of the individual is very important. Mm. So, so there was this, um, just such a huge difference, you know, where all of a sudden, and I think growing up as a female, you know, is also related to this where, you know, growing up as a female, and I know somebody watching this from like my country or even family members are going to be like taking issue with that. But, you know, there's a lot where we're not, uh, you know, you're taught to do what's needed, right? Mm. For the collective, for the family, and that makes sense. But um, the individual wants and desires, and that is important. And then, I landed in a country like the U.S. where, you know, there's this big, uh, you know, individualism and what is it that you want? What do you, you know, which was difficult for me in the beginning. So so then I, I had to I had to actually figure out what it is that I want because I had never been thinking about that before, you know. Um, yeah, I found myself not being able to tell very often uh, or right away. You know how some people, like, 
either proactively know what they want or like when asked, they can just come up with, uh, you know, a few items or whatever pertains to the situation. But I wasn't able to do that. So it was, so it was important for me to figure out, to discover what is it that I want. Mm. And so how was this? How was life then? Uh, Cause how, how long, um, how old were you when you, when, when you, um, was it your, your entire family that moved to, to, to us or. Yeah. Separately one by one, right after the mm. Berlin wall fell in 89, my dad, you know, my dad was, so I think he had those ideas even before that. Um, but as soon as the, because Bulgaria was behind the Iron Curtain, so it was very difficult to leave the, you know, Soviet <laughs> satellite system. Um, mm. So as soon as the Berlin Wall fell in November of 89, like just a few months later, immediately like a tours to the U.S. started popping up in Bulgaria and people started leaving en masse, you know, and mm -hmm. my dad with a bunch of his friends. I think he was 34 at the time. Uh, they they decided to up and go. He didn't speak any English. Had three hundred dollars in his pocket when he landed in New York City uh, in nineteen ninety. Um, you know, in the middle of nineteen. And I remember, like, my mom telling me I had just come back from summer camp, and she said, "You know, your dad is gonna go to the U.S." And I was like, "What?" Like, I it was such a you know going from the U.S. was not something I knew much about at all. Mm. You know? um, I mean the u.s was we were in the soviet union camp right so yeah. cold war <laughs> those were the enemies <laughs> um so it was very surprising it was very unexpected it was very abstract i was 14 years old and then my dad came to the states uh without speaking english with very little money and started like scraping by like working as delivery finding the bulgarian there was like bulgarian immigrants that were helping each other so they found each other and stayed in new york and and then he called my mom and he said, you have to come here. I see the opportunity, but I can't do it alone. I need you. So then my mom left four months later and my brother and I were uh, left with our grandparents. So we stayed and lived with our grandparents for two years. I was 14. My brother was nine. Mm. And it was re really challenging. We didn't, I didn't see my parents for two years because there was no way for me to leave Bulgaria as a yeah. year old you know and my parents are illegal immigrants at this point they're already like illegal in the states you know uh but i got a student visa to study english at columbia university this was a way in which people at the time were able to get a, a visa right so I got the visa and and that's how i came i was 16 years old this was my first time getting on an airplane was to leave Bulgaria and to come to the US um, by myself <laughs> was a bit of an intense, you know, uh, thing. Also, there was no direct flights at the time from Bulgaria to the US. You had to um, fly through any European. So I got to stay in Paris and spend the night at a hotel in Paris by myself. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you all? Did, did you, as a family move, um, move directly to New York or was it? Yeah, was yeah, my dad just stayed in New York. Yeah, my dad yeah. just stayed in New York and they had a little, they lived in a room. They shared uh, an apartment with friends of theirs. They lived in a room in the Bronx. Hmm. My mom told me that at some point they were uh, using curtains as, as covers uh, to sleep with. Like they were so not having any money whatsoever, you know. Right. Yeah, it's, it's kind of you know, trippy to think about that. <laughs> and how, how did you, as, as a, um, yeah, a young person, um, experience that, that transition then from li uh, living in Bulgaria and then all of a sudden you are going to Columbia, you study English in, in the United States. Um, it was, it was shocking. <laughs> it was absolutely shocking. Yeah. Um, you know, at that stage at 16, so I ended up not attending the course at Columbia because it actually was very expensive. Mm -hmm. So we changed that. And then I was able, my parents just said, you know, you're staying here, you know, we're not going, which was another shock to me. I'm like, what do you mean I'm staying here? Like, what about my brother? My brother, you know, had stayed behind. It would be another three years before he joined us as well. And, and my dad, I mean, I have to, I want to like make a movie or write a, a story about how my dad 
went and got him because my dad had to go there with, you know, um, fake documents and my brother also liked to get him out of the country, you know, for the family to be reunited. And my brother hadn't seen his family in five years, which at a very early age is very difficult, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, so then at, at least fortunately we were reunited here in the U S but so I was here and at 16, you know, and my parents found me a, a school. Fortunately, they were, they had some savings by that time and they invested them in me. They invested them in my education. So they put me in a small private school in Westchester, which was great because it really, I mean, it was, it was very, um, I don't know. I felt like, <laughs> like, where am I for the first year, you know? Mm. Fortunately, I spoke some English, so it wasn't completely foreign to me, you know, but everything was different. And I missed, I missed my brother. I missed my family in Bulgaria. I missed my friends. You know, I left at 16 when stuff start, starts happening, you know, mm -hmm. you're yeah. teenager fun and learning about life. And yeah, I just kind of had to start over a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the, the um, I was when the, the the Berlin Wall fell. I was like I don't know three or four years old, so I mm -hmm. I didn't even compute. I guess or what happened. Um, but like later on in, in life, when you learn about the whole situation, um, mm -hmm. there's at least for me, I don't have a um a good um a good view or understanding like how life was. Uh, mm -hmm. behind 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 mm -hmm. the iron curtain mm -hmm. um because because there yeah was not a lot of talk about 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 that right wow where were you at that time when you were two or three years old where holland. were you living in no, holland? No, no, yeah holland yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. uh I, I have to tell you i have so much nostalgia for my life back home uh and that's another thing that anybody's watching this is gonna like take issue with but i had like the most beautiful childhood it was close to idyllic uh, for me okay. as, as as a person living there up until I was 16 living honestly in that system I, I saw I, I heard of no crime almost like crime was non -ex of course it was existent I didn't know about it you know mm -hmm. um, it felt completely safe I could I could walk you know by myself it was safe um, I didn't have many like you know, during communism, I, I, I tell the story, Pam and I have laughed so much about this. She calls it the little gray coat that you had so little choice. Mm. Honestly, in the winter, there would be, I lived in a town of about 150,000 people, which was like the sixth largest in Bulgaria. So, you know, fairly town, right? Mm -hmm. City. Yeah. Um, and, and we had like the department store, there was one department store, of course, other shops, but in the department store, so they would, they would bring the coats for the winter and there was like one or two kinds, that's it. And maybe the one kind had like three different colors, you know? So there yeah. was a lot of, um, there wasn't that much standing out. And I don't remember being like that jealous about things or wanting like new things. Cause there weren't that any, mm. there just wasn't that much material goods to be had. Uh, some people whose parents uh, worked abroad or had things imported, of course, was like, whoa, these sneakers, whoa, you know, but it never felt like something that's accessible to me. So I don't remember caring that much about it. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it was very peaceful. Yeah. It was just um, kind of idyllic. I remember it. <laughs> because what, what I remember in, 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 in school, and maybe this is also like why it is, um, uh probably like feel like drenched with assumptions is that um <laughs> that the what's um uh, they uh wrote into into curriculum and, and school books and everything else was that that the light behind it iron curtain what was was terrible it was it was it was um uh, uh <laughs> like um you cannot even survive you know like like long wow. lines and food <laughs> and everything else you know so Wow. That is that that's a prevailing view that has been created um, of um, of that was created back then. I see. Um, yeah. I mean, life behind our wall. You, you know, it's similarly the life behind on your side of the world. I have a dictionary from those years. It's it's a dictionary that dis that explains what foreign words in the Bulgarian language mean. Okay. And literally like Dadaism or surre surrealism, like imagine like any of those movements. It says 
a degraded or like a debased movement in art, like it qualifies it as a bad thing. That's like an official dictionary that people refer to. So there oh. was like this in, you know, remember I was a child. I mean, okay, I was a teenager, but if you ask my dad, he has a very different view of that time, right? If you ask like adults, I didn't have that. I didn't have to, I was protected from the political um, aspect and you know, my dad has a lot of resentment uh, and a lot of anger about, I mean, freedom was so curtailed at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. freedom to listen to the Beatles or like whatever Western, because they were seen as things that would, would um, erode morale or people's, I don't know, attitudes, you know, just like such outdated views. Mm -hmm. uh, this was more in the 70s. I mean, literally my aunt um, and my dad, you know, men could not wear long hair. Even my aunt, like she had to have her hair like in a bun. And if she didn't, it had to be cut short. You know, there were lots of rules that didn't make sense. They had to follow. Yeah. Was, was um, do you think it's a, a, a good thing that um, you, you, your dad, um, protected you from the reality uh, if, if i may say it like that so that you could just leave yeah lead your own life without any um like concerns like political concerns yeah yeah i think yeah. so okay. yeah i think so for sure yeah you know i, I was aware i mean there was the, I, I was aware that we couldn't be critical very openly of the government yet that my dad was or like my family, you know, but you had to be quiet about it. So, you know, I was aware that there is, there are some things that you couldn't do, but there was plenty of other things that you could do that I was happy with, you know, just playing with my friends, hanging out with my friends. No one was putting a ban on that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, um, um, th thank you so much for sharing that. Cause it's, it is, um, I, I'm, I would have a, not always, but I have a, like a. I just want to know. I'm 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 a, I'm a very curious person. Mm -hmm. I'm saying wanting to know, like, all right, uh, like firsthand, like what was life like on on an island or in a community mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. instead of um of, of yeah, having to take it as it is, um as it is written in a, in a book or um in reports or whatever you know that that's um i think it's so much more valuable to yeah you know, to hear some um from stories from people themselves about right. um how life was like or because I, I i yeah i think that is i think that is so important nowadays um that um yeah it's not that we um not take anything, anything more at face value, but um, try to be curious and try to figure out all right, what what uh, what is what is happening? What am I seeing right now? And and like what? Um, yeah, I just want to know like the the full story. Like I don't I don't want to like regurgitate headlines when I'm in uh, when I when I I don't know uh, um, learn about a situation and people ask me about something. And I, I just like. All right, I just throw out some headlines that I read uh, on Twitter or, or whatever. I guess mm -hmm. I would, like I don't know, like it's, it's something that I um, developed over time, actually, or not, yeah, you know, recently. Um, the more and more curious about. All right, I was curious, but now taking that step of right. All right, now I don't know, but mm -hmm. I do want to know. So like, I just I'll just ask. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's. Hopefully that more and more people are doing that. Doing yeah. the same. That's what I hope. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, it is. Um, uh, the personal experience, the lived experience. Mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, um, it is so important to know the nuance um, that it is not a, there's not, not one prevailing story about something, but there's, there, there's, there's a story of Nina and there's a story of, <laughs> your dad and your, your brother and your mom and they all, all have their own uh, ways of looking at things and, mm -hmm. and that is interesting um mm -hmm. to to yeah to 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 learn and to to hear those stories and and to people to tell them like while we still can yeah um, um hear those stories that's, yeah that's right on yeah so um 
you so how all right i'm just going to make one jump because that is something that that i um uh um interested uh, i'm interested in a, in a lot of things yeah. um the all right so so you, see, you arrive in the us you you what did you do because how did you end up all right so the one thing that fascinates about you, me about you is all right being from bulgaria but you know portuguese as that's <laughs> like it's one of the few persons that i know um from early on that that uh, as <laughs> super fluent in, in portuguese um Porto with UNIP. <laughs> sorry, sorry what Oh, it's more like a portoñol, you know, Portuguese and, and Spanish, <laughs> they call it portoñol. <laughs> I could not hear the difference. You know, like, you can, uh, yeah, you know, so like, it, it's, um... You speak uh, Portuguese? Pff, no. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, uh, I, I wish, I wish I, I, I could do it. Go to Brazil, it's super easy to learn once you're there. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, Rio, Rio Plus 20, I was in Brazil for, mm -hmm, for a, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the only two words that I, that I learned was fala inglés, as in, as in asking people if, if they knew English <laughs> and, and, and that was, that was pretty much it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed actually that, uh, I was, I was there for so long that, um, 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 that those were the only Portuguese words. I even got to meet, um, uh, Gilberto Gil. Oh my God. And, wow. Cool. Yeah. I, I like the, the world famous guitarist and, and yes. Um, even it, it was it was actually the equator equator initiative. Oh, was it at the prize? I was at the say, prize yeah, at the prize yeah, at the prize ceremony. You know, I met him backstage because um, all right, I, I just I should tell the whole story. <laughs> um, just I don't that. know. It is one of the one of those things that like Pam has a very for people that are listening and watching Pamela Craft, executive director, of Tribal Link Foundation, and mentor very, both men, of us. mentor. Um, and to quote Damon Corey about, uh, is she is seen as the, the, the fairy godmother of indigenous peoples. So, um, yeah, full true. disclosure. So, that's and true. I love her two pieces. Um, yeah. uh, so she, um, she got me to Rio. Um, I wasn't even planning on going to Rio. Mm -hmm. Um, it was at the permanent forum and I remember Erin Hinkle, like so, so the previously mm -hmm. she was helping out Pam, mm -hmm. came up to me like, all right, I just want to put on your radar. Pam is thinking of sending you to Rio. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Rio what? As a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a store in New York to pick up some stuff? Or like, <laughs> what are you talking about? No, not Rio de Janeiro for Rio Plus 20. I, was, I thought it was a long shot. I was like, all right, yeah, it's an idea. Um, who knows what happens? Um, little did I know, like... I think a couple of weeks after that, I was on, on a plane on my way to to, to Rio um, for Rio Plus Twenty. Um, I remember that? I remember what she um, and she and she has a funny way of 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 um, creating opportunities, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what I love about Pam so much mm -hmm. is that she is able to get people into positions that. Uh, or, or roles or, or a, yeah, um, capacities that, that I could not even, yeah, that they, they could, could not even comprehend being, being in that role or position or situation. Um, so I like photography. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. I had a, I had a, a, um, um, a camera, like a, well, I'm, I'm, like, I'm a prosumer. So like I, I spend a lot of money on, on cameras and everything else, even though I'm not a pro, um, you should talk to my husband because he's just the same. <laughs> oh man, like yeah, we'll, 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 just and, So yeah, we, we definitely like uh, we'll talk talk about your husband and 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 drones as well because yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. oh, that's also super super um, exciting, fascinating to me. Cool. Um, oh yeah, but, oh yeah. So um, camera and yeah. was taking a lot of photos and everything else, and so her idea was. To send me to um, Rio to um, help out with the Equator Initiative, as in like this, um, to take photos of the of the um, um, the, the people that yeah the um, um, what was it? Um, the winners right like the, the right. people that that won, won the Equator Initiative. So they brought all these people from all around the world mm -hmm. to Rio, um, and so the first couple of days were were um, 
like a like a training kind of thing. At least that's what I recall. Right? The community um, dialogue space. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah, because you are so into the equity initiative. So like, correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, cause yeah. Uh, or like add, um, if, if I, if I, um, uh, forget some elements. So yeah. So a couple of days of, 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 um, this community training and it was amazing. And then the, the initiative, um, the prize ceremony itself, mm -hmm. um, I was asked to take photos. Um, but I, I thought, I, I'm just gonna take photos of people uh, before they, because we went onto buses from where we were towards the uh, place where the, the ceremony was held. It was a very long bus trip, um, yeah. so they take photos of the the trail. But I, I didn't I didn't know that the idea was to also take photos of the the the, the ceremony itself. Yeah. So um, there was this big um, theater, and. Um, I was, I, I, uh, yeah, I don't know, like, like the one of the photographers. Like, like you had all the, you had all these people with these amazing cameras, and there, there was I with with my so-so camera. Um, but the thing, or the the, the 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 difference was, I had access backstage, so uh, I got to meet um, Edward Norton, the the actor. Okay. He was he was doing he was doing the uh, he was doing the, um, uh, yeah. the ceremony. Uh, cool. uh, all of the MC, he was one of the MCs, and mm -hmm. um, and I also got to meet uh, Gilberto Gil. And oh. two amazing things, our personal um, uh, experiences was, were that one, I got to guide uh, Edward Norton through the um, the first uh, yeah ring because he wanted to meet the the winners, and but but there were a lot of people that wanted to meet him as well. Of so yeah, he asked me like, "All right, could, could you could you point me to the winners because I want to talk to them?" Nice. So I just had to like walk in front of him, and I like, "All right, this is um, this is he he is from Bali, and uh, so there was some some from Bali and like, all mm -hmm. around the world, and he's from Fiji." And with the thing with Gilberto she was, um, that's the most funny thing. It was is that um. There were so many people around me. Like we were in front of the stage where he was performing, and with super deluxe cameras, and I with my myself with my so so camera made the perfect shot of Gilberto Shield um, compared to, to everyone. Everyone's everyone else was looking at at my um, my screen is like holy shit that is like the the perfect shot. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, so I did that just a little bit the. Um, um uh, a, a few anecdotes actually for from um the brio plus 20 and the equator initiative it's such an amazing program that um it, it is still ongoing right the oh yeah absolutely yeah, initiative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you, you're, waiting, you're part of it yeah i'm part of it and we're waiting to hear whether we're going to have a prize this year mm, okay waiting to hear from the funders to see yeah um yeah, for people that, that are not familiar with equator initiative could, yeah. could you explain a little yeah. bit what, what yeah. it is Sure. So the Equator Initiative um, is a partnership of the UN, the big NGOs such as Conservation International, TNC, some governments and civil society organizations that support, they try to identify, celebrate, try to scale and um, influence policy with the solutions of indigenous peoples and local community best practice around biodiversity conservation, and reduction of poverty, um, and also climate mitigation, adaptation, and so on. Uh, the Equator Initiative was started in 2002. This, the, at the time, there were studies that were pointing to the fact that the greatest amount of biodiversity and the greatest amount of poverty were both found in the equatorial belt between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of, Cam of Capricorn. So at the time, uh, several, I think Mark Malik Brown was the head of UNDP and, and a couple of other people just basically on the back of an envelope said, what if we start identifying who are the local examples, the grassroots examples of the people uh, preserving that biodiversity and, and also reducing poverty. So um, it's still ongoing. It used to be by every two years. It's It's been also every year in the past few years. Um, there's a more than 275 winners from across the world that have been identified at the equatorinitiative.org website. There's a huge repository of these solutions, both 
both those who have won and also all of the nominations are available for people to search and read. Um, and recently, so it's always been for groups that are in the trap in the in the equatorial belt. But as of a few years ago, in consultation and in conversations with indigenous peoples, it was clear that let's open it. If it's an indigenous community, then it can be anywhere in the world because mm -hmm. they're understanding that the situation is much the same, even if it's in a developed, developed so-called developed country. Mm -hmm. um, so for the first time in 2019, we awarded the Equator Prize to, to uh, a Native American community, the Yurok tribe in the US. And then in 2020, there was one in Canada. It's the Lutzel K. Dene Nation, so, which is very exciting. So for indigenous communities, organizations, it's open, it's across the world. Mm. Okay, and so so what um what do we have, what do we have people have to do actually not but not that it should be like oh to win the prize but um what is what you're looking for in terms of um mm -hmm. yeah the yeah to, to, great uh, initiative yeah absolutely looking for community ownership mm. an innovative solution to a problem that ha with to the loss of biodiversity or climate change scalability the possibility that the solution can be scaled or and or replicated replicability mm -hmm. and then a strong governance of the initiative right. with the specifically with the participation of women and and gender balance yeah and equity okay. yeah i would say those are yeah and did you uh, this, this is really this is really what i miss actually um, <laughs> do you <laughs> It is, it, it is, sounds very crazy, um, but, but um, the sounds of New York I is... Keens, is I miss Keynes also. <laughs> you miss karaoke nights at Keynes. <laughs> oh, oh, please. Yeah, um, it, it is, it, it is, it's the small things. Uh, it is yeah. the karaoke nights at Keats. At Keats, um, right, sorry. Um, uh, uh, having a, a, a quick breakfast at Olympia across the street. Of course, yeah. Did you ever uh, eat at, at Healthy Nuts right next to Olympia? Did you ever eat there? Health Nuts? Uh, no. Oh, oh my God. When you come back, you must. They they have, it's like a health food store. It's right next door to Olympia, but in the back, they have a kitchen. They cook there. It's I, all I, 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 I went in just yeah. to get, I, I think I, I think I, I, ne I needed to get aspirin or something. So I got something in there, but, um, but never went all the way to the back. Yeah. Yeah, amazing wow. home cooked, all vegetarian, super fresh. I didn't great know. Great smoothies, yeah. It's a really cool spot. Man, that, that's that's yeah, like it is. That's what I miss a lot from um, yeah, from the yeah, quote unquote New York life, um, the UN life. I, I would say <laughs> is um, frankly, <laughs> it it's it's like for example, where when we do project access, like in the morning, we go to Cafe Olympia. Get get a quick uh, quick I don't know bagel or whatever and then oh, hop on yeah. over to to uh, UNDP do our training yeah. and and uh, in the evening like showing people around the first time to the UN oh, um, so so like show them Times Square and and everything else it, and but it's definitely the small things like ninety nine cents pizza right um, yes around the world <laughs> you know it is um, <laughs> yeah these well and then the sounds of it as well. Um, yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine you're so used to it right now, by now, or annoyed. You know, I I live in a in an industrial. So I live in Lorient City. You have to come over next time when you're traveling. Where, where is it? I, okay. Where you is know, Lorient City? City? It's exactly across from the UN. Oh, okay. In, but it's not. It's one. It's not the high rises. It's no. it's, it's a shorter loft building. Um, you can see my building from our office, from where we have project access. Ah, so, okay. But it's kind of an industrial part also of town. It's where Amazon right. wanted to have a big headquarters here. And there was this whole debate about Amazon. And ultimately, the local uh, government you know, said no, because there was a lot of pressure from the people. Mm -hmm. But it's a very industrial part of town. In the morning on weekdays, um, trucks line up in front of our street, and they start idling in the winter you know, to keep the... Oh, yeah. For like half an hour, forty-five minutes. That is mm -hmm. my wake up. Instead of like rooster somewhere, like you know, <laughs> in the village, <laughs> we have trucks waking us up. <laughs> mm. Yeah. 
So, so you, you take the, the ferry across the East River then yep. instead of yep. the, the train. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that, that's where you are. I yes. used to live I mean, well, when I was in, when I, you know, during a world conference, I, was, I stayed in New York for a while, like half a month or half a month, half a year. When you were rooming with Esteban Sio? No, he was, he also lived. No, we're not, we weren't rooming. He was staying oh. at um, somewhere oh. around 135th Street and Park. Okay, I thought that you guys, for some reason, that you, you lived together. But so then it must have been that you both were here for an extended period of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like yeah, we had a lobby lobbying team, and we we all stayed in New York. Amazing. Um, where did you live then? Long Island City. What? Where? Yeah, um, Queensboro Plaza. That that's like um, yeah. that's nearby. Yeah, nearby. Yeah, right yeah. Here. yeah, we were there last night. I take my son there rock climbing. There's a rock climbing gym. Ah, oh, okay. It's new. I don't think yeah. it's here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah years old yeah there, yeah there was there's a lot lot of like places that were still they were still build, building something probably like that rock climbing place yeah, yeah. um but yeah yeah i, I uh, lived in, in that uh, apartment building um at queensborough plaza and That's what, you took the seven train always a seven train yep. um door to door like it was like 20 minutes for I from know, so quick, you right? to the, yeah it was it's so great uh, actually that was I got asked a while ago, like, what was um, the uh, the um, the the best feeling you had within the UN up, up until recently, up until last year? It was the moment, well, not that moment. It was the the, the train ride from Queensboro Plaza to Grand Central Station, Grand Central Station, um, on the morning of the World Conference on, on Indigenous Peoples, when we knew that everything was said and done yeah. it was and was just it was not even the adoption itself mm -hmm. but it was standing in it in in it in a subway in in a, on a, on a seven train standing wasn't sitting listening to some music mm -hmm. i just looked out the window and you see like yeah a little bit a little, little bit of queens brooklyn and then and then move into and i was like wow this is this is but that's that's a, that's a moment of bliss you know as in like yeah. wow this that's is a iconic, this is a great moment right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah that was that was uh and yeah it's only like 20 minutes and it was as compared to um esteban show like he was he was staying all the way up in harlem yeah. um that it took him uh, like an hour and a half or something to yeah, to even hard. make it to grand center station and you have to walk over to the u.n still yeah. so uh, yeah it was yeah um does Long Island City always will always have a special place in my heart? Um, I love that. And then you're gonna come yeah. here and we're gonna fly drones from our rooftop. Oh yeah, yeah. Are they allowed? Because because I don't know. Like it's not it's not over the Why must you ask LaGuardia route, right? So it's like Why must you ask that question first? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Yeah, it is. Do, 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 do. No, probably not. Probably not over the, but. Yeah, um, uh, now you mentioned drones. Um, what's what triggered the um, the is it hobby or or like made you, yeah, get into drones? Actually, I'm going to for that part of the conversation. I'm going to change my location. Oh wow! Right. Background. Check this out. I'm going to have my tea. Nice cup of tea. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I'm going to show you what. I'm looking at here, my neighborhood. See? Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now I'm gonna sit here. Speaking of drones, we're gonna have our. Wow. All right. I'm looking at a wall of drones. Yes. Oh, holy yep. shit. Exactly. This is what George right. spent a lot of his time on. Because those things aren't cheap, right? Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> Nope. No, sorry. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> I mean, these fortunately are starting to get cheaper. And, uh, mm. you know, when you're like so deep into the hobby, oh, sorry, my phone. Let me just turn, turn off the, the. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's like one, two, three, four, five, 15 drones that I'm seeing. And one's even bigger than the other. Holy moly. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Thank you so much. So, oh, yeah. 
So what got us started? Um, well, when I met Georgie, uh, have you? Did you meet him? I think briefly at the Perinform reception. At the reception. Or yeah. Project exactly. access reception. Yeah, yeah that's, briefly. That's the only yeah. place he would have been at. Yeah. Yeah. So when I met him back in 2010, um, this was his singular obsession, still is. Uh, this was his hobby and obsession. And so a lot of our weekends spent together were in one field or another testing some kind of machine that he put together. And at the time, they were the airplane that you see up there, up there. Yeah. Was, yeah. So at the time, there was there were all airplanes. This was 2010. And he had been into the hobby for a few years already. And he's one of the pioneers of what's called FPV, the FPV movement, which is first person view. First person okay. view means that you're using virtual reality goggles and um, you're flying the drone. The, well, at the time, it was not a drone because a drone has its own brain, it has autopilot. If it doesn't have autopilot, it's, um, it was a remote control airplane at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were not called drones in 2010 at all. So, 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 so a drone is, is can be called a drone when it has its own software, as in like a um, I know, a brain of itself. It, exactly. I mean, that's I don't know that that's an official dis distinction. <laughs> yeah, but it's sure. definitely yeah. a distinction that that we've been using and, and okay. in, the, in the community, because otherwise it's a remote control airplane. It doesn't right. have yeah. the ability to to fly unless it's it's controlled by a um, by a pilot. So okay. at the time he was building his own, mostly flying wings, like very simple delta wings. Mm -hmm. But the the hardware was complex because so in order to to see with the goggles, you have to have a small CCTV camera. It was sending analog signal to the goggles. Mm -hmm. That's how you knew where you're flying. And then there was another camera, like a GoPro, that's recording at the same time. Right. So you have two cameras on board, and you're flying. The goggles let you – I'm looking around. I'll show you goggles in a little bit. Um, they let you fly far away. Uh, you're not limited by line of sight. Again, at the time, 2010, there were no regulations. So um, you could fly far away all you want. Um, not in the city necessarily because the, there's lots of noise here. But if you mm -hmm. go out in the country, in the countryside, not a flat problem. So I started spending a lot of time with him. And by, by virtue of spending time together, I was around the hobby a lot. So then, you know, he is just such a fan of it. And um, he wanted to teach me. So he taught me how to fly. In fact, one of my first airplanes, that was a kid airplane, had UN and then, you know, my initials and then UN. <laughs> Oh, nice! <laughs> kind of really cute, yeah. The 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 trainer, the trainer plane. Mm -hmm. So then, these quadcopters didn't come in until uh, maybe 2015, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, but let's let's backtrack. So you know, 2010, I meet him, and it's all great. You know, it's really fun. But he's doing it just for fun and it's to record videos. You know, to record. Yeah. He's an artist, so he just wants to produce content. You know, and beautiful videos. And then I'm like, okay, this is great, but it's not like my hobby 100%, right? So, and then I'm like, how can this be useful? How can this be useful? And I was working on Red, as you, as you might know. I was mm -hmm. with UNDP and working with indigenous peoples. And I started sending them the videos that we were making to some, specifically the Alianza Mesoamericana de Pueblos y Bosques. And to a colleague of mine who was working in Panama with indigenous peoples for us, and and he was like, "Oh my God, this is amazing! We need to we need to give this to indigenous communities so they can monitor their territories and you know and and get evidence of illegal activities." Right. So, Alianza Mesoamericana they had a relationship with Ford, and they were like, "This is incredible!" There, it was the permanent forum in 2013, I believe. We had um, basically Alianza Mesoamericana came to our neighborhood. There was a, a big parking lot at the time. They brought Ford. We had flights. We do a couple of flights and we sat down at a table and Ford was like, all right, let's, uh, what would it cost, you know, to do pilots to see how this works in the rainforest situation? 
Right. So we okay. got a proposal together, and we got some funds to um, to try to pilot this, <laughs> pun not intended. Mm -hmm. Pilot this um, in Peru and and Panama. And so in 2014, we went to the Peruvian rainforest with IDESEP, which I don't know if you know them, but they're the key indigenous people's organization there in the Amazon. And Rainforest Foundation US were there, and Alianza Mesoamericana de Pueblos y Bosques were there. So that's how, so basically that's when uh, we established Two Shift Serials as, as an initiative um, that the goal of it was to try and use to, to use remote control airplanes and drones for humanitarian environmental causes, specifically training indigenous peoples and local communities to use them. And how how can they um, how are these can these drones be of value to indigenous people? So, like, what's what do they contribute to? Um, they are capable of obtaining evidence um, of illegal activities um, and then then seeking redress or recourse. They are also you're able to monitor degradation or you can first response um, provide evidence for you know, disasters if there was some kind of a landslide or mudslides or fires, um, anything that would be dangerous to humans you're able to mm -hmm. send the machine and assess the situation get video you can get real life video it real time video you can get the video also when the craft returns mm -hmm. um, we have worked a little bit on delivering vaccines for example delivering medication or other things with the drones mm -hmm. i was working with mm -hmm. Celine Cousteau for a little bit I met her through a friend. We became friends, and she has a project in the Brazilian um, Vale do Javari, which is the second largest titled indigenous territory in Brazil. Mm. Uh, so she's working there, and um, they the people had requested to be able to deliver vaccines. Um, challenging, very challenging, because there's no electricity, and we don't have solar drones yet. Um, yeah. So you have to, you know. How long can a, can a drone stay in in the air then if it's um, on mm -hmm. one full charge? So I mean, it's it's they they run the gamut. Um, the okay. one you see behind me, the quadcopters. The quadcopters are very short. They 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 don't stay up very long because you're limited by the size of battery that yeah. you put on there. So let's say that in best case scenario, it can stay in the air for, uh, half an hour, thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. that, that's about it. Okay. Um, with a larger, larger quadcopter, you might be able to push it to forty minutes, something. But if you're in a rainforest setting, you really want to have both. You want to have a quadcopter which lets you take off and land in very tight spots, and then you can get close to subjects. Um, and and you also want a delta wing or an airplane which lets you go as far as as possible. And mm. an airplane will stay in the air for hours. Right. Uh, once it's, uh, you know, yeah, it, it'll stay in the air for hours. And um, if it's in a rainforest situation, there's no noise uh, to to interfere with the radio signal. Mm -hmm. And or the airplane can have uh, an autopilot and you can pre-program a grid, a pattern grid of flying or a path of flying, in which case the plane is just flying on its own. It doesn't even have to be connected to your radio anymore. Right. Yeah. Okay, so so it, it can also in, um, help with, for example, like illegal logging. I would assume that, that it, it can help with that, and but also yeah. like crop growth. I, I was I, I was thinking, yeah. and, and, yeah. and so it's okay. You can assess crop growth. You can put all kinds of different sensors. We haven't tested sensors ourselves, uh, but there's there's a lot that's being done on what's called precision agriculture. So you can actually mm -hmm. assess the health of plants with spectrum imaging uh, and then be able to define where more watering or more fertilizer, if you're using that sort of thing, um, this is for larger productions, you know, but mm -hmm. yeah, you can put all kinds of sensors. You can assess, as I said, the health, the height, uh, you can measure the carbon of the plants. I mean, this is hugely helpful. This is something I'm working on with UNDP as well. Like we want to be able to figure out how indigenous peoples and local communities can uh, use spatial data 
to reduce deforestation, for example. There are examples of communities that have won the Equator Prize actually doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and also feed that information, you know, into some larger platforms, Global Forest Watch and others. Right. Yeah. Um, cause I'm, I, I, um, so when I, um, yes, yeah, so read actually that, that you were also like, well, I knew that, that you were just started this, um, this company uh, with drones, I read, read up on, on some stuff and, and, um, there's this, there's this, I, someone said that, uh, some former, like, yeah, all right, here's what I did. Here's, here it is. Former Wired editor imagines a future where everyone owns a drone. Is that is that, yeah? Is, is that something that that that, that is possible? You think? I yeah. mean, I think it's possible, but I don't know. It's gonna get a little cluttered. <laughs> yeah. I would say so. Yeah. It's gonna get a little cluttered. Um, With Amazon no, I, packages and everything else. Yeah, exactly. You you remember the fifth element? Mm, yeah. Have you seen, do, do you remember like the levels of traffic at different levels in the sky? You know, the guy with the kind of the boat craft selling. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think so. You know, here's what's happening also is that drones, I'm going to show you some of the smaller ones. Drones are becoming smaller. Mm. This is. Like it kind of fits into your purse almost. Yeah, in, in your it, backpack. Totally, totally. Yeah, this is a little bit in like the cocktail drones. I like to call them. <laughs> <laughs> right. you can fly them around at a cocktail party, but you know uh, the miniaturization, and that's why a lot of things have been possible, is because um, the components are getting cheaper and smaller. Um, so I think yeah, people could have these to maybe be able to monitor their own landscapes, you know, lands, take photos, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, you name it. I mean, I think it's possible. I think it's going to be very cluttery, but yeah, but I, I would, I would imagine that you need, um, cause if, if you can have, cause if, if a drone can be, um, have several purposes, um, monitoring, um, different things, it, it would need like software to do that. Right. To, to be able to yeah. run that. Is right. that, is that freely available or is that something that you have to develop yourself? How, how should I, is there an eBay or something that, or, um, for that or Amazon? Yeah. No so, uh, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, when we started doing, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of DIY. So, so this mm. communities, you have the hardcore people like, like Georgina who are very DIY and they share a lot of information uh, and then you have the people that just buy a DJI drone, you know, off the shelf and yeah. that's all they need. They just get it and don't need to worry. They do that. But there's a whole DIY community. There's a lot of open source software. When we went to the Amazon in 2014, we were using only open source it's called mission Contr mission planner. It's a, it's a, you know, the problem with, with open source things that sometimes they're kind of more clunky, you know, the user experience is not mm -hmm. as polished, I would say. Right. Uh, so it was a little challenging to teach people, especially in the one week that we had. But yeah, there's there's open source software, and like Ardupilot is what is used for autopilots. Ardupilot is, uh, you know, yeah, that there's a lot of code out available and a lot of software. So it is possible for somebody to learn it, and a ton of resources online on YouTube. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What is um. What is the dream for you, actually, in terms of um, what do you like to achieve or like would like to see a drone, what a drone can do? Yeah. Have you, have you thought about that? I, I have thought about that. I Personally, for me, um, and, you know, George and I differ in this because he's much more interested in its artistic use. Mm. Uh, and he wants to take a camera in the sky, you know, and like the more advanced, the more amazing camera, the better, you know, to, to really um, show the aerial perspective or unusual um, views. For me, it's for the advocacy and for the, for the you know, protecting the environment. And right. I would like all indigenous communities that want to have the tool, to have the tool at their disposal mm. because... Um, it can be really helpful in deterring, also deterring illegal activities, monitoring them, getting evidence, and yeah. 
just yeah. being able to better. It, it's another tool to protect their territories right. and resources. Yeah. Is there is there a way of I don't know, I, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah. Uh, because uh, for example, um, I I know that Microsoft once uh, provided a whole community um, laptops and everything. Um, right. for, just to be able to code and everything, and just to uh, to make them familiar with with coding and and, yeah. and but also to yeah um be able to um collect data on, on yeah uh, making sure that 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 the community um has data that they can uh, use to improve their 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 well being and lifestyle. Is there anything that I don't know? Like, is, is it an idea for to uh, approach DJI, G, DJI or whatever to? Yeah. Like, hey guys, Indigenous peoples, um, illegal logging, um, biodiversity, eighty percent. You know, you know the whole whole story. Right. Um, help us out. Is, is that an Has that been asked uh, uh, by someone at some point, or is that some? That's a good question. I don't know oh. that it's been asked. I've had that idea. I have had that idea before. Um, it hasn't been asked. Yeah, I think that if if there's the right project, it we it can definitely be sent to DJ. I know I know there's special counsel, somebody that was a lawyer and became famous for defending um, one early case of, of a guy whose name is Trappy, mm -hmm. uh, who got a ten thousand dollar fine for flying in the University of Virginia campus before wow. rules were before the rules were. Um, defined yet yeah well brendan shulman was uh the lawyer who defended him and successfully fought that uh that you know and got it off his back so he was known as the drone lawyer and he's the now drone. <laughs> the drone lawyer uh so now he's the special counsel at dgi so we have an oh. in there you know we have a connection yeah 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 it's interesting to see like how uh because i read um a couple of years ago, no, no, yeah, a couple of years ago, you saw that um, I think it was London Heathrow, um, the airport, yeah. or JFK, yeah. um, that, that people were like out. trying yeah. to get. I, I get it. Like you want to get a nice shot of a airplane or A three eighty taking off. No, um, that, but... is, that is not allowed. You cannot be within five miles of an airport. That that's at least in the U.S. That's a guideline. Yeah, that you have it's... to respect. So uh, is it is it is it um, mature now, and in, in terms of like the the rules and regulations around drone or mm -hmm. drones piloting, or is it still in development, or are they still trying to? Uh, no, they're out. Limit? They're they're here. I mean, drone regulations are in the U.S. at least. You know, they're very defined. Um, you have to be registered. You have to, if you're doing it commercially, you have to have uh, certification. You have to register your drones. If they're over 250 grams, that's why you can fly something like this <laughs> that's under 250. Yeah. Um, you have to uh, fly, not fly within five miles of an airport, less than 400 feet. Um, yeah. yeah. So... We, we know those things and, and not, you know, you have to take off and land in designated places. And in New York City, there's only very few. Mm -hmm. You can't just take off and land from the street wherever you want. Uh, oh, I thank God, no. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> That's right. That's why this thing with everybody owning a drone, you know, it, it has to go hand in hand with regulations. Like what, for what purpose and yeah. Yeah, because like a, like um, a, sim a simple drone like the, the one that you had in your hand, like like mm -hmm. what good does it go for? Like a couple hundred dollars, dollars I would one, assume. Uh, I mean, this one is it, that's a good question. I have no idea. Probably less than that. Now, I mean, this is this is uh, he builds all of those that you see there are, mm -hmm. are hand built by him. Oh, it's really DIYs. Like yeah, it's, it's completely oh, wow. DIY. It's like, not up shelf kind of thing. No, no, no. None of these is none of these is all wow. of these that you see are home built, hand built by by him. He buys the frame and then mm -hmm. he buys the components. But those guys know the the inexpensive websites to buy directly. You know parts. So so right. it comes out cheaper than if you were to buy it because you're not paying for the labor. You're just doing the labor yourself. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I well, I obviously I should check um, um, your YouTube channel, the, yeah. the oh, teacher, uh, YouTube channel, and I definitely recommend people to wa watch it because <laughs> it is um, like the, the the footage or the videos actually. It is the the first thing that came into my mind was it was like a whole new way of showing art as mm -hmm. as in as in. 
um, yeah, it is almost like yeah, how do you call it? Like, like poetry actually, like, by, oh, wow. by 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 the movement of, of of the camera. Like what it's like, you only get to see that mm-hmm. um, in movies, obviously, but only for a short short for mm-hmm. a couple of seconds. But this is like I don't know, like if you put a put on a, 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 a I don't know. A, um, some nice music underneath it. It will could yeah. easily be in some uh, movie in itself, but it is right. yeah, it, it is a whole new form of art. Um, yeah. I would say, like 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 sh- shooting video with, with drones. Is, is that what your what your uh, husband is aiming for? Is, is that yeah. is it? Um, okay, yeah. oh, that's, that is what he's aiming for. Yeah, uh, and and I don't know if you've seen some of the videos that do have the music. Of, no, because there were so many videos. Um, yeah. Actually, so that I, um, yeah. I still have to, I still have to go through them. I will. Um, I will. I can send you some select ones. But um, yeah, so so that is exactly like combining footage with with music to evoke, you know, to be evocative, you know, art. Uh, I think that he wants to contribute it to productions, uh, to to film, and uh, yeah, just art. Just showing right. the beauty of, of, of the aerial perspective because it's just not something that we have access to uh, on a daily basis. No, yeah. You know what's so interesting is that so there's uh, the New York City Drone Film Festival, and um, the founder of the Drone Film Festival, Randy, Randy Slavin, he's um, somebody we know, but he during the summer he was doing these talks like once every week. And he was pushing the the hobby community, you know, the FPV and and drone community, to find a use for the footage because it's like, all right, you know what, guys? Like we've had now like six, seven years of amazing aerial footage, and <laughs> yeah. okay, it's incredible, you know, art. I mean, there's the art, you know, but the other thing is flying for the flying sake. Now, how do we incorporate it? Or like, it's almost like a solution that it's finding its its problem, you know. Mm. Sometimes right, like yeah, yeah. drones also have a lot of un unfound yet <laughs> um, problems, so to speak, like what they can be used for. Um, but mm-hmm. he was pushing the the community that's producing this content to think about story. How can ah. you incorporate the aerial perspective in a story, or can you tell a story um, with the aerial perspective? And mm-hmm. and I wanted to do this. Um, but George had never agreed to do it. I don't know. He didn't. He see. He's he, he's very strong in his own artistic understanding. And then I'm wanting to have my own artistic, you know, understanding. So mm-hmm. a lot of clashing happens. But I have. I had this idea of. Um, we have a little tiny trailer upstate New York, which is on a small airport, and uh, that's where we go fly our drones. And I mean, we have an agreement with the owner of the airport. It's it's tiny, you know. It's just like. Um, single engine airplanes there yeah. and um you know it's, it's just a beautiful place it's a, it's 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 a trailer it's a little trailer so but there's a forest next to it and i wanted the drones to be a protagonist in the story it's a short story and it's it's a woman okay me uh running through the forest like clearly being chased by the drone and then there's another drone filming the chase and and the idea uh because i've had that and i think a lot of people have a fear of that technology i mean yeah. also we know the drones in the military context have been used you know to to kill people right so yeah. we know that it's a weapon of war um and that leaked into and and actually we had issues back in the early in 2013 we participated in um in an art show at the queen's museum and we were displaying one of our homemade delta wings and some footage and there was a woman that wrote a letter and she complained and she said ah oh, don't call it drones you know or, or these airplanes that you know they're used um in war and um yes but making that distinct that distinction between What's a weapon of war? Um, there's also at the UN. I don't know if you if you've heard about the killer robots. And there's all this work being done about banning killer robots. So the, the killer robots is that new UN yeah. resolution? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a, yeah. One of our friends who is a professor at the new school was working on that. Yeah, that's what they're okay. called. Yeah. Oh. No, I yeah. didn't hear. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, okay. So, so, the, so I wanted to kind of like embody that that concept of where, and I've also been scared because these drones have come way too close to me. You know, mm. I mean, obviously they're flown inside our house, 
and um, and so I just wanted to kind of embody that that anxiety uh, that is around the the technology, yeah. stuff, but he didn't yeah. like that idea, so we did oh. do it. <laughs> I know. I still am gonna do it. <laughs> so uh, uh, some way somehow, because yeah, I, I can I can imagine that people get anxious or a little bit have a develop a little bit of fear for drones in terms of um, obviously like like I said uh, like. But those drones that, that that were used in in Afghanistan and and everywhere everywhere else, they were like they were nothing close to what you're having on your wall. These Not like at all, no. the U it's like UAVs. These are like the like huge yeah. huge, huge they're, things. Yeah, they're huge. They carry they carry a huge payload. They go yeah. hundreds of miles. I mean, it's a completely different. Yeah, like there's a, there's, I mean, there's this, this movie. I can't remember which one, but like you, you could basically sit just sit in somewhere and and and. I don't know in 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 Idaho or Tennessee and, and just and and control one exactly. uh, that's flying yeah. over uh, Baghdad or or kind of horror. Yeah, that that yeah. description the UN is referring to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, in that sense, I I I, I um I, I got that that there that there's some kind of resolution right now. Yeah. That's because I'm I'm surprised that they call it killer robots. Um. That that's because it, it, it would imply that robots are like autonomous, but like these are drones are, are mostly like like driven by like piloted by people that are in Idaho or whatever too. Um, For example, or but also autonomous because those people also just uh, can preload a mission. I mean, uh, what I mentioned okay. this party pilot is an autopilot, and with this open source software called Mission Planner, you mm -hmm. can. Um, program the path at the exact GPS location. And as long as you're close enough to launch, you know, when we were doing the missions in the in Peruvian rainforest, there was no internet there. So yeah. we had to pre-design the missions before we left. Okay. Yeah. Were, were, like, were drones used by the military bef before consumers used it or was it the other way around? I don't know. I, I believe so. Okay. I believe so yeah. Mm. Oh, that's, so. that's a good question, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and then it's also like yeah, like like I said, um, privacy is also something that people can be very. Oh, like, yeah. So those things can can fly into your homes. Uh, I will not, not fly. Into, well, they can fly into your homes, right? Or well, yes, of um, course. I if mean, you, if you have your door with open, the small obviously. ones, with the small ones, you come in and out of. Uh, again, your range is not going to be that that you know that far away. So yeah, but you, you could fly into somebody's home. Mm. Yeah. So, so like, uh, yeah. Would you would you say that? Um, yeah, it's, I think it's always um, the the intent, right, and the user, like like what what the user yeah. intent is with absolutely with, with, with something. Yeah, yeah. that that yeah. But yeah, they, they, those things look. look um, but they make they make a lot of noise though. I right? like they, 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 they don't, you don't have silent ones, right? Yes. Oh God! See, that's what I, I do want to have. I want to have a silent one. I want to have one that's solar charged and made of sustainable materials like bamboo. Of course, you can't make the motors and and things, but maybe uh, to a large extent. Yeah, you know, we were in um, Crater Lake. Crater Lake is a beautiful national park in um, the West, the Pacific North. Is it? I believe in Oregon. Yeah, I believe it's in Oregon. Uh, okay. We were there in 2011, perhaps, and of course, anywhere we go, Georgie's traveling with at least one or five drones, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, remote control airplanes at the time. So uh, we had a very large wing that we were carrying as oversized luggage, and we were in Crater. Actually, here's a painting of Crater Lake by, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, I can see it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that, that's where yep. it is. So this is our our um, George's best friend and our best man <laughs> at our wedding. He he painted that. But so Crater Lake is this pristine, blue, gorgeous lake, super mm -hmm. quiet. And there we go. And and I have to tell you, I I had lots of like fights with Georgie about this, and I was mortified because it's completely pristine and gorgeous and peaceful. And then all of a sudden he's like, I have to fly here, and he's like, Brrr, you know, all of a sudden like this. <laughs> this noise and i'm just like ah cringing absolutely cringing you know and then of course sure enough and he has the goggles on and and i have the goggles on and sure enough in a little bit we hear steps doop, right doop, 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 and i take off and and it's a ranger it's a park ranger 
and the park ranger is like, what the F are you people doing here? <laughs> you know? <laughs> what are you, why are you disturbing the sacred peace of this place, you know? Mm. Um, and, and yeah, he, he made us land right away and, and we did. And, and honestly, I don't blame him. I, I agree with him. And then I'm stuck in the middle because, uh, between angering my partner, you know, who's, who's gonna, who's like, <laughs> you know, he was, he was, didn't have a problem doing that, you know, right. Uh, artists, right. I mean, I don't know. Artists sometimes go to great lengths to get. To be express their artistic. Art. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. Create, yeah. Oh yeah, I can, I can, I can. No, not I can. I can see that definitely, definitely. To a I mean, level that's kind of yeah. uncomfortable to me sometimes, you know, like mm. it's just like I'm like, oh, like I, I, I try to, you know, respect what the rules are. <laughs> yeah. And when you when you travel, like, do, I, is it is there something to do with, uh, with that you cannot put drones in um, your uh, check luggage, but you have to do. You have to do it like the um, batteries. You carry on batteries. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can put the batteries in your check luggage. Yeah, because they can catch on fire. Right. Yeah. So okay. then they just wanted them to be in the cabin. I'm like, is that better? <laughs> like, is that better? <laughs> oh, I can see the smoke sooner. No, there's. We always travel in. Uh, we there, there's special battery bags that are like fireproof. Oh, okay. We have special fireproof uh, battery bags. Yeah, I I have some here because yeah, here. But if you travel with like five drones, lipo guard. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you put all these batteries in there, and that which. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. We have several of these. Yeah. So I'm gonna try to find. Um, so you always have like extra carry on, I would guess. Oh my! Like... Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were always. I mean, and and when we were going to Peru, you know, that was people look at our bags with multiple cameras, and they're like, "What is this? You know, where where are you guys going? And what are you doing?" That's when my UN badge came in handy. <laughs> I was about to say, like, well, did you ever leverage your like your UN badge? I, I did. I did. They were they it immediately like uh, it immediately you know get some respect. Mm, yeah, uh, as you know, right. Um, I, I I've never flashed my UN badge. Um, oh really? But I no no. It's right. um, I I I know I know people that um um how should I how should I put it um <laughs> every year when they go to the UN they go to the, go to the gift shop uh huh get UN t-shirts and those lanyards and everything else and they yeah. they they just get away with almost everything at the airport. They really? the, yeah, they get the they get the diplomatic routes and they get the the dip, diplomatic treatment and everything. Oh my god! And, and you have not used that yet. Um, no, maybe because I'm a wuss. I'm 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 not that that confident. Um, when it comes when it comes to that, you know, I just um, I, I just I, I just have my fair share of like negative experiences at the at the airport. Without a UN badge, that I don't think that a with a UN badge, it could. It could um, you, you've been to plenty of airports in your lifetime, right? <laughs> oh, Newark is the worst for me, at least. Um, I have so many really? bad experiences with Newark. That's why at at some point I always told, uh, whenever I had a had a flight or somewhere, people had to arrange flights, yeah, or with the voluntary fund. Um, please, please fly me through JFK. Uh, like yeah. or like Guardia, or fly me to Boston, and, I, and I'll, I'll I'll catch a bus. I don't I don't care about that, but not New York. <laughs> so many, uh, not not many, but like almost um, uh, like, like traumatic experiences with, with no, not traumatic. Not I don't want to be so so dramatic, but experiences with, with uh, TSA over there in in, in in at Newark, and that was that was, yeah. Um, I had. One what was one time I was um, flying through Newark to uh, Panama, Panama City. Okay. Of uh, and yeah, it was for a, a IITC meeting. Uh, that was so that was oh. in 2012 or something or Great. 11, and stopped at the airport because I checked my luggage. So like you have to you have to clear your, check, clear your luggage again. So like you have to check and all right, pick up your luggage and then check it in again. And yeah. And I had a layover of like four hours. I spent three hours arguing, not arguing, uh, app, like debating 
with with TSA and and with the the, the customs uh, um, uh, border patrol of to let me go through uh, to Panama because um, so wh where are you going? I'm I'm going to a human rights co um, event conference. Um, oh, uh, who's inviting you? So I want to see an invitation and everything else. And um, yeah, do you have? Oh, do you work uh, for the UN? No, I work a lot within the UN. Oh, let me show you your badge then. Well, I don't have my badge because I'm going. To, I'm not going to the UN. I'm going to Panama. Oh my god! So like back and forth, uh, making me do a lot of things. Uh, wait, uh, wait a lot. And then on the way back, it was even worse. You know, they they um, always got like almost got into a fist fight with with the oh. with the border patrol. Um, because um yeah like he he did not want to give me back my my passport uh, like it was checking my, my my someone else was checking my luggage and this guy didn't want to give me back my passport and yeah. so i barely made it barely made it to um my connecting flight uh back then that it's wow like it was yeah i don't know like, like they were already like they were, were already like made the final call you know like final call they yeah. did that so um um yeah new work is uh, uh -uh, no no um <laughs> not my not my uh preferred airport that's preferred that but, is where, yeah that is where i landed from bulgaria that oh place, really yeah new work airport new work liberty Air airport yeah it's, and um, then and then when you drive out it's like such a abysmal scene with these like smokestacks and there's nothing hmm. like where am i <laughs> What is this? This is right, not New York. Exactly. Well, this it, is New York, yeah. And it is, it is so confusing to a lot of people. It is, yeah. it, it, it is confusing to a lot of people because they, yeah. they think you're, you're flying to New York, yeah. but you're actually flying to Jersey, yeah. um, <laughs> and it, which is like a long, it, it's, it's so far away from New York. You can see the New York skyline, so though. So far away, yes. You can see it in the distance. So far away. So far and it is, it is so, so um, confusing to a lot, a lot of people um, that um, everything is, for example, the Giants. Like uh, uh, the Giants and the Jets, yeah. they they don't play in New York. They play in New Jersey. Um, yeah, because that is what we, what Esteban and I found out, found out because we wanted to go to a game, and we thought, all right, it should be in New York. No, it was in Jersey, and we had to take like two or three buses to get to the uh, to get to the stadium, <laughs> to get to the uh, Met MetLife Stadium. So That's it was, um, yeah. You have Giants you know. playing in New Jersey. This is what I mean. You know, it's it's a New York Red Bull, the the football team, the soccer the soccer team, uh -huh. um, New York Red Bull, but they play in New Jersey. Uh, so it was it was it was sounded like 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 the Rangers or the the New York Knicks, like they weren't playing Madison Square Garden. That's yeah. New York. That's that's New York to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, yeah, the giant the Giants or the Jets. I thought always thought it was in New York somewhere in Brooklyn or or, or right. Queens, Bronx, or whatever. Makes but sense. it's actually in New Jersey. It's 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 all in New Jersey. So, um, yeah, it's it's confusing to a lot of people. I, I remember someone he wanted to fly into New York, and the only um, the route that person could take was to Newark. Um, mm -hmm. But except New uh, New York Liberty New uh, Newark New Jersey. So um, he kept on declining that 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 flight because um, he said, "No, I don't want to go to New Jersey. I want to go to New York." Um, so it took it took a while to explain to him that that no, that is actually New York, the broader New York area. Yeah, uh, so, but exactly. you have to take a uh, serving New York, York. <laughs> serving New yeah. York, yeah, the metropolitan um, yeah area of New of New York. Yeah. Oh, you saw you landed in. I, New I Jersey. wanted to look. I found the goggles. I want to show you one of the pairs of, of goggles. Wow. This is a, that looks like a, like a VR Oculus. Exactly. But it, it's way before Oculus. More. This is, we're talking about like this can be, the, this company is called Shark, uh, Fat Shark. Okay. And they make these FPV goggles. These are antennas, these are antennas. And yeah, so you put them on and you have the little and, screens. Okay. Yeah. And 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 like the feed is that like real time or is it, there's a lag of, it's of a... real time? Oh, okay. What is yeah, there's good. I I think there's very I think it's negligible lag. Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, this yeah. is analog. This is um, analog signal, but now there's digital, digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit! Yeah. So, um, so what what's the um, 
So you, you got you, you and your husband started your own company. Um, it's to, not really Ariel. Company, to be honest, like it's we didn't. Not, it's not registered. Like we didn't register because oh. we could not decide. Because at first, you know, the first money we got was, or the first gig we got was mm-hmm. um, with from Ford. So it was nonprofit. So we're like, should it be a nonprofit? Should it be for profit? So then it's kind of more like a sole proprietorship, you know. Um, okay. It, you know, we have the name, but we have not made that decision or that call of whether to make it, uh, you know, a nonprofit. I think it's probably makes sense for it to be for profit or at least like a B business, a B Corp, mm-hmm. what it's called, you know, that. Yeah, but we haven't made that decision. And yeah. OK, um, but but you, you so so uh, so it's. But but I like it though. Like it, it's something that you you love to do. It's like a, yeah. like a hobby. But it, it, it's it's yeah. turning into something that you can, um, yeah, something that you can. I want to say like make a living out of it. But it's something yeah. that you can. Um, well, I mean, George is definitely can. hoping. Okay. Yeah, 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 for sure, absolutely. I mean, we've we've he has been getting hired. You know, because he does the flying. I don't do the flying. Mm, I do okay. PR and the networking and getting the opportunities and mm, okay. all that and and he builds he custom builds the craft if needed and then he does the flying he's really the expert pilot um, so we just recently were hired to to do to work on a production um, actually they were friends of ours they were filming La Boheme if you know the opera yeah uh, they were doing a film based on the opera but La Boheme in the time of COVID. So mm, okay. you know, yeah, so so we were hired to provide um, some aerial footage, and one of the shots was so tight because it was among like there were about ten actors in a very tight scene. So he had to fly one of these tiny little little guys around the the characters, and it was kind of <laughs> hairy because you know bumping into things. One of the flights he bumped into something and fell. So, but it's mm. really fascinating. It's really great. I like to be on set too. It's really fun to see how how films are made. You know. So I think at some point um, we need to do like project access with, with another module uh, attached to it and uh-huh. how to fly a drone. I love yes. drone flying 101. Um, that's, that's, that's a great, no, I'd like to, I would like to create that training kind of like a training and that's what I'm trying to build at, at you know, UNDP right now, the nature for development team, because we do do work on spatial data with government mm-hmm. where trying to uh, basically improve the quality of spatial data that that's decision makers are using. But, Can you explain spatial data real, yeah. real quick for people that um, yep. are listening, watching? Probably going to do a very bad job at doing that. But, uh, you know, geo- it doesn't have to be a legal explanation. It right. comes with, uh, that comes from the satellites, for example, mm. uh, that is referenced, that has G that is geo reference so it has gps coordinates uh it's it's aerial and it can of different resolutions right different mm-hmm. resolution aerial gps coordinates data that can be used to monitor assess make decisions mm-hmm. um this was our team was working on the um, six nr the six national reports to the cbd right countries have to report to the CBD, and and we found that um, governments had access to very few and very old maps. Mm. So the first thing to do in order to be able to better report and make decisions about biodiversity is to have better maps. So a project was put together and it got funded um, to to work with partners like NASA and create a, a website, you know, platform that makes sense of satellite data. That can be, um, you know, all the Aichi targets are there, water, wildlife, human settlements. There's like a hundred different layers. Mm-hmm. So the website is called unbiodiversitylab.org. This is the website that UNDP created with NASA and other partners in the University of Maryland, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that governments are using to be able to, you know, look at um, their country's resources and then the next step from that is work that's called ELSA, Essential Life Support Areas. These essential life support areas are basically, now that we have this map, we can, let's prioritize what is the most important to a country in order to achieve its its biodiversity and climate and SDG goals. Mm -hmm. And then um, be able to create that map and figure out what, where, 
we need to manage, protect, and restore territories. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in the context uh, in the context of this work, my my work is to make sure that indigenous peoples are involved in that because you can imagine a lot of these essential life support areas coincide with indigenous territories. Yeah, yeah. And 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 on the uh, on the other side is that we want to provide the training for indigenous peoples to be able to make sense of spatial data, to use it, to read it, and to produce their own with things like drones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So, so that that is um, um, being rolled out at the moment. That that's what you're what you're working yeah, that's on. That's what I'm working on right now. Yeah, it's it's at the very beginning stages. Yeah, we have to um, you know show make some use cases and try to get money. Now there's we don't have funding for that yet, but that that is what I see that there is a need for that, and what we've heard from Equator Prize winners too. Yeah, and you, you um, do you, you think? Obviously, you 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 want to you want to see that because, um, but we all within the UN context, there's always you need always to have that 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 goodwill that that uh, from people. Um, is, is there um, a uh, understanding from uh, from the UNDP or people that are um, that make the, those decisions of of the need for it? Um, is it some, something that is or is it that, that growing? I think it's growing, you know, like everything. I think it's growing, like everything. Um, there's so much education that needs to be done with different stakeholders on indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. as you know. I mean, this is just across the board. And I found that with this work with uh, the UN Biodiversity Lab, our counterparts are very technical mapping GIS institutions within environmental ministries. Mm -hmm. And so they, some of them don't work, you know, with communities or have worked on other things. So there's always, there's always education that needs to happen. Right. Yeah. And, and the, and the partners, um, are they, are they these partners that, that you, um, approach your, that you, you approach yourself or they, do they, um, offer their, their assistance? Um, how, how, sh how should I see that? I mean, um, in this case, basically, we talk to different governments and uh, country offices. We start with talking to our colleagues at a country office and and talking about this platform that we've developed as a result of this, um, you know, report that we assess mm -hmm. the country. So, so they say, oh yeah, great, you know, this can be useful. And then there's a conversation with the government, and the government expresses an interest. It's basically, you know, the the government and the country office have to express that interest. For us to step in um, and to be able to provide that that support, and mm. for a while, you know, it's it's a very very technical thing. It's a very technical thing about um, prioritizing shapes, layers of of data that are already available, putting them together, making them work on the platform in a usable way, and then being able to almost like toggle the different options so that you can get different scenarios. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, th is is that what you think? Um, if I li listen to you, um, is that like the, the next thing? Like data? Is is that is that something that is going to be, yeah, um, important? Do you remember? Do you remember? Were you there with, when Michaela said? Um, I think she talked about genetic data being the next real estate. Genetic data. Yeah. No, I was. It was a project access, and um, yeah, we were talking about um, the genetic data of of plants. You know, for example, the uh, genetic resources that was in that. But anyway, yeah, I absolutely. I mean, yeah, it it gives. We need it. You know, we need it to 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 be able to concretely. Um, make make decisions and um you know for indigenous peoples a big way that i see the un is paying more attention is saying 80 percent of biodiversity is in indigenous territories can't argue with that mm -hmm. yeah. you know, um it's it's no longer the moral imperative is important of course but mm -hmm. when you have a little bit thicker you know heads and you yeah. have to provide other angles of information i mean you know this so well from your extensive advocacy and diplomacy work is finding the right way to talk to decision makers 
and having data is important and having those facts to back it up is important yeah yeah mm. yeah it's um uh blah, blah, blah. was there was something that i um that i read uh, a while ago and we which um because I, I saw all these um these around the UN, so not just UNDP, but like all uh, not not just UN agencies, but also like UN branches, like UN uh climate change, biodiversity, and all the other. They're they're they're, they're starting to use that those um, language that actually connects to data, like uh, mapping exercise and and, and et, et cetera, et cetera, and. Uh, to me, it, it, it makes a lot of sense because it, it, it actually, we can get, if you took a little, like a mapping exercise and the way that I see it is, yeah, you go, for example, like you could go use a drone, for example, all right, this is, the, this is, this is our, our territory uh, that's um, on a global scale protects 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, that, that um, I, I was super, um, how, sh how should I say it? In, in support of that, I read one, one, and this is this is why Google is, is so 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 scary at some point. Um, I read one article article and it, it threw me off because um, I was like so certain of of like data of like data can help us, and then if you, there was one article that said um, that there's a potential, um, and because it was linked to rights. To, to human oh. rights, yeah, and I said like um, with um, data mining or like gathering data, yeah. it could lead to rights by algorithm. That sounds terrifying, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that was I was kind of, kind of like that sounds like oh, holy shit! Like I never never thought of that. I, I don't want like sound like a, like a tinfoil hat kind of guy or. or <laughs> um, uh, I do you call it conspiracy theories and, and all yeah. that, but it is, it, it threw me off. Like, wow, yeah. well, there, there's there's a potential and then, um, of of data, uh, um, if the, of, not not data, but rights based uh, rights being uh, awarded or like uh, um, respected based on algorithm. So when, when I when I read that uh, that article, I, I was I was kind of, oh shit. Um, because data is a big thing now, like um, in terms of, um, yeah, the ability to map the the the, the, the lands and territories of, of indigenous indigenous peoples. Have you ever come across something something like that? Yes. That that yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, several thoughts. This is a huge topic, right? Like mm -hmm. just tremendous. And um, in the context of this work, I started, you know, attending some conferences. Uh, there's the Indigenous Mapping Workshop, which is really fascinating. The Firelight Group, they're based in Canada, First Nations peoples in Canada. Really amazing. Um, uh, they do a lot of incredible trainings, and they have these training workshops. And, and I attended that workshop, which was virtual. And it was fascinating. There's a lot of work that Indigenous peoples are doing, scholars are doing on Indigenous data sovereignty. Mm -hmm. They are the care fair principles, there's already a set of principles that have been elaborated, uh, papers published, uh, written and published about um, indigenous data sovereignty. And, you know, and so that's very important for anybody that's going to work with indigenous peoples on data. Um, you know, for, for us, for me right now, we're at a stage where I'm talking to the indigenous peoples and communities. That's exactly the kind of things that we need to hear. What are their concerns? What are their caveats? And, and we have heard, you know, indigenous peoples are not necessarily interested to just provide, create, produce the data and then provide it because mm -hmm. in some situations this can expose them to danger. Yeah. So it's, a, it's actually a very complex area. I, uh, you know, I haven't even, you know, it's it, very much at the beginning. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of things to consider before launching into a full blown program. Uh, I mean, we're at a stage where we need to do a needs assessment with the Equator Prize winners, for example. Mm -hmm. 
and right now, um, let's say we've heard from one community there, there in their Maasai community in Kenya who want to use drones to monitor their the wildlife, for example, right. um, and and hopefully deter poachers and and so it's for wildlife management, um, and then there there wouldn't be any any proposal or anything to use the data for anything else. It, it would be strictly for their own use. Mm -hmm. But you're touching upon a very, very important, huge topic. And the, what I was referring to, Michaela, Michaela um, Jade, Jade yeah. yes, is, is uh, from Australia, Aboriginal woman from Australia, who mm -hmm. is also a mentor at Project Access and, and has her own incredible um, media and um, technology company. So she had talked about um, a project called Earth Bank of Codes. Did you hear about that? No, uh, okay. I heard about it, but I cannot recall actually what it exactly entails. So that rang bells because that's an effort to to capture the genetic information of all plants, just all life on Earth mm. and put it on the blockchain and make sure that via smart contracts, you know, payments for any of its use go to the owners of the knowledge or of the plant or the resource, the animal. Um, and of course, Michaela raised that point and, you know, said this has huge implications for indigenous peoples because, you know, countries will uh, dispute, for example, the ownership of, let's say, a certain plant. You know, the, the, the project came about because look at the Amazon fires, we're losing species we don't even know yet because yeah. only about, what is it, like 10% of the Amazon is studied. So there are, there are plants and resources that, uh, we need to urgently study and, and um, you know, before they disappear. Right. Yeah. But but there's a big caveat there as well. Mm. Now, th 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 thank you so much for for for, for um, th th those points that you made because um, it it um, because for, for, for some something like data sovereignty is something now I can put it into the right into the right context. Mm -hmm. you no, know, like like when when people start talking about um, because the movement is so big. The mm -hmm. Indigenous People's Movement is so big, yeah. Um, that um, I'm, I'm, my niche or something that 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 I very much involved in is is rights and, and human rights and mm -hmm. now oceans, climate change. But mm -hmm. there, but there's a wide spectrum of things that 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 are um, that affect Indigenous peoples. And when people talk talk about um, data sovereignty, like it didn't even literally. It didn't, it didn't compute yeah. as in, as in like, I could not see this connection, but now like having read the, that article talking to you about, about uh, like the, 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 the merits of, of, of using drones data and everything else. Now, like to me, data sovereignty all the way suddenly makes sense, mm -hmm. you know? So, so it is, um, um, so like, it's, it's like being, being late to a party. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm late. Um, We're at a different but, party, Ghazali. Yeah, you know, like yeah, but but then again, like yeah, maybe she like at least embrace that I showed up at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, to, to the to the party, and um, and I think data sovereignty. Like, I think I talk a lot. I I spoke to Michaela on um, um, different like a like a like a short conversation. Uh, but I was totally different. It was, it was about entrepreneurship and and, and, and digital and, and Minecraft. Holy God, like Minecraft, I love it. Sure. Um, uh, but not necessarily about this. Um, but it is, it is, it could be um, like one of these these great areas, blind spots of Indian, indigenous peoples. That and that's what, that, that's what my my generally what I'm I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of is that. We are not um, aware or conscious of of things that are affect us. And like, you, you can talk about Article 18, the right to participate in decision making processes that, that affect us of the Declaration, but mm -hmm. you need to be aware of the process. Mm -hmm. um, so, like for example, things like data data sovereignty, like it is because this whole this whole universe of data of of, of, of uh, uh gathering and 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 everything else it's moving so fast 
that um, the what I'm so afraid of is that once we are get arrive at the party, the party is already over. You know, and, and to say to play that whole analogy out, it's yeah. not a party, obviously. Um, but it is, um, yeah, something that is it. Yeah, you know, actually, to this, I can say that um, when I was doing a lot of research around this, uh, indigenous peoples have been working on this in the WIPO context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. genetic mm -hmm. resources and databases at the time. Yeah. You know, there, there's actually specific language and positions that indigenous peoples have come out with um, related to to genetic resources, information, and databases, yeah. 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 So. Yeah. N n still, but th that's, th that's um, uh, it's not as mainstream as, for example, like, it, like if you use the, 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 um, the, the perm form as your barometer, for example, right. uh, or you, your measuring stick, Mm -hmm. um that because in a, in a way it is for inform or the expert me mechanism whatever gets mm -hmm. on the agenda is a pro is is a is a topic of concern mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. covid 19 for example is now on uh, for obvious reasons is right. a topic of concern before that traditional knowledge right. um but things like data has not really right. been a uh, on come been on the agenda and when you talk about self-determination you know like in 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 and i think about when you talk about think about self-determination i think about like in everything not just about lands territories and resources but in this case also about your your ability to choose for yourself or and, and which also includes data being able to protect your own data and, mm -hmm. and, and so yeah makes me wonder like why has this not been on people's radar or been put on people's radar yet in, yeah. in, at a scale that has become had gotten on the agenda of um yeah like the extra mechanism and and or the perm form like the wipe what, what they what these people are doing at wipe is, is amazing like um it's it's um i only i only got involved in in knowledge traditional knowledge indigenous knowledge since climate change since in the uh cop 21 and i still mm -hmm. don't have a i don't want to say i have a clue but like it i barely scratch the surface mm -hmm. about uh, uh about traditional knowledge uh, indigenous knowledge and now in oceans have to deal with uh marine genetic resources um so um it is it is like a whole new discipline of, of rights protection mm -hmm. like when, when we're yeah. going to the wipo it's like um because i'm 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 in awe of people that that continue going to the white. And the white process is a very if if you think that that the other processes are slow, <laughs> then 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 brace yourself for the white because <laughs> it is it glacial is, speed. <laughs> yeah, glacial speed. It it is is watching paint dry. Um, really? <laughs> um, that, that, that's what um, Frank Edward Gishik said uh, from Anishinaabe. Like it's it's uh, going to the white process. It is important. Um, yeah. But is it is watching paint dry, and I even saw heard at a side event at the Perm Forum, the last Perm Forum, two thousand nineteen. There was some event, or well, not not white pole, but it was it, oh, it was on ocean ocean uh, um, uh, for the ocean treaty. Um, yeah. that it, and people said, they were talking about white pole, and all these countries said, yeah, but white pole is so slow. And even when states say. Yeah, that wipe always slow. That then, 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 then they're really slow. And um, you know, it's really slow. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. How, I I don't know how it got it got to this one, but yeah, but what's um, super super important the whole whole data data yeah. sovereignty yeah. conversation and, and and it's and yeah, the, the normal people like that they um because we link it to. Yeah, data we link it to our sovereignty, and other people link it to the privacy. Right. Um, but it is um, so. Yeah. So the so to, like you said, you know, it, it's about trying to make people aware by by using different ways of explaining things of mm -hmm. of, of rights. So maybe in terms of data sovereignty, that um, 
that, that you make the general public aware of it uh, through privacy. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a yeah. think, thinking out loud on, on this yeah. one. Are, are you still involved with uh, the LCIPP? I yeah I yesterday at a um bef before we had a, our meeting I, w I just came out of that that um LCIPP um workshop uh, training so okay. yeah that's that's I'm still like involved in a way that I'm tracking what's going on um obviously the, it is has its facilitated working group and they're they're um have a work plan and are working on it right now um so I'm just tracking what's going on um as in I know there are other processes with it under the climate change that are, uh, yeah, because like, in, in a way the, the the platform is there, you know, like it, it can it can it's it's alive and, and now you know it's like a baby and it needs to learn to walk and like and you, you can't hold hold its hand for the, uh, for the rest of its life. Not that I am the father of 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 it or, or something. Um, so, Partially. but but for me, partially. Um, I was, I was, I was at the table for for the negotiations. Um, oh, yeah. So in a way that um, I do feel a sense of, um, uh, um, um, yeah. How should I put it? Um, as I hold it very, very dear to me. Actually, that's yeah. what it is. Because you yeah. you saw it, you saw it incubate. You you saw it become alive, yeah. in a way through advocating. Uh, texts where we, like in, in being at the table and, and having to um, um, argue with, with other states mm -hmm. um, on uh, where to put one one tiny word um, uh, in, in what wow. sentence brackets and everything else. So in a way, I feel a sense of yeah, um, a sense of um, attachment as as like yeah, it's, I was I was I was. I was I was I was part of this, but there there, there are a numerous uh, like you know um, in the UN there are numerous processes that are still going on, yeah. um, and and under climate change there there is several that and and one is, um, uh, um, yeah the carbon markets that that is still ongoing, mm -hmm. and which I'm trying to focus on right now. Um, That'd but be yeah, to have me? I'd like to have a talk with you about that. Um, off screen i mean you know oh, just yeah. uh just about that because with the new york declaration on forests uh mm. now we want to be able i'd like to know you know i'm also sort of trying i, I want to know what are the you know the what what indigenous peoples are fighting for uh towards cop 26 what are the key issues and so i you know so that we can we can include those and promote them under the new york declaration on forests as well yeah, that, that would that that would be super super helpful. Um, yeah, because because right now because it, it is likely to be finalized at COP twenty six in in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. um, the only question is obviously will it be in person? Um, but I, I I do I do see see a trend not a trend um, but it see do I think I saw a press release or something that that they're hoping that to have in person meetings at COP twenty six. I know, so, but it's like, in their hybrid model. I don't, yeah, so, yeah, something along those lines. Um, yeah. But the, definitely, like usually, there's the, the uh, subsidiary body meeting in May in Bonn, and but that's that, that's that's going to be virtual. Um, it's, it's way too soon. Yeah. Um, it is super important for Indigenous peoples that um, that meeting um, mm -hmm. is open to for in, in person participation, so that we can um, participate. Because I don't see. Um, uh, indigenous peoples being able to effectively um, influence or let, no, advocate uh, for, for um, our priorities in a virtual setting, because um, mm -hmm. because um, it, it, it is, it's such a fact. The, the 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 yeah the, the the final so Article Six is such a fast paced process. That it, it it's almost impossible to um yeah to to follow it online through email or or Zoom mm -hmm. or whatever um it, it has to be like on like a on the grounds in person uh, process mm -hmm. um so for Indigenous peoples um it is super, for for one super important that it is online often online sorry <laughs> in person yeah 
Um, and uh, it is we we came very close to uh, being kicked out in terms of uh, right safeguards, uh, human rights and indigenous rights um, mm. uh, safeguards. Um, we were in so uh, in three articles, three paragraphs, yeah, three articles of of, of sub articles was reduced to one, and now we have brackets around the reference to indigenous rights and human rights and rights of indigenous peoples. Wow. Um, the luckily Article Six was kicked. Um, was they could not resolve it, so that it was kicked to COP twenty six because the idea was to finalize it in in Madrid. Um, that at the final, when they ch um, decided to not finalize it in Madrid, um, Tuvalu is w one of the um, the champions of the rights of Indigenous peoples and human rights in uh, Article Six. Said, all right, if if we're going to quote unquote kick it down the road. No, no, quote, unquote, I'm not going to quote them. Uh, this is not what they said. Um, I'm, I'm, if, if we're going to move it to COP26, at least um, let's make sure that, that there's some, that we can reintroduce some language again. So, for example, the rights-based approach. Yeah. So um, that that is um, from what we could have achieved to what is on the table right now. It, it's, it's like a, a world's difference. Mm -hmm. um, but so the, the only thing that we're looking at is like an omnibus, Paragraph um, that uh, protects protects the rights of indigenous peoples and human rights in all aspects of the application of of Article mm -hmm. Six. I think that's what we're looking at right now. I think that is, given the current climate um, uh, or the political climate, I mean, uh, what we can achieve. Because um, um, yeah, anything less than that is it's not being not having any human rights reference, and that would be detrimental. Um, yeah. For new people, so yeah. So that's. Mm. I, I know you didn't don't want to talk about it, but it is. It, it's, um, it's, um, so so helpful to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So th that is um, in in um, in in a uh, how, do, how do you say like in in a in a nutshell, um, yeah. the, the art, Article Six um, carbon markets and even and I, I I'm I'm the first one to admit it because I needed I I was the one to um, I I'm, I'm leading the the negotiations for for these peoples on Article Six. Um, oh, at least in, in Madrid, as part of the IIPFCC. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, amazing. And um, one of the first when, when I saw when I was um, had to brief Indigenous peoples. All right, all right this is what Article Six is. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people knew about it. Um, one of the first comments that I that I received was, "All right, yeah, but but like we, um, our, uh, carbon markets is something that we should be against. Like it, it is, it's not good. It is right. It, it, it is is bad. And mm -hmm. I get that. Like I." I Surely enough, like uh, like ninety nine percent of the Indigenous people don't want uh, th th this whole um, carbon market mechanism um, in place because um, most of them had bad bad um, yeah uh, experiences with with red and everything else. Um, but the the problem is it is there it, it is there right now. So mm -hmm. either you can just leave it be and see like right, you know I don't just I don't agree with it. Um, I denounce it and yeah. I just leave it be. That that that's an option, right. um, but or um, while whilst there still is an opportunity opportunity to do to do so, you you go in and you try to make sure that at least it, it respects the rights of Indigenous people that 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 uh, like free power from consent, self determination, yep. and everything else that that is protected. Um, so it is not perfect. Um, I'm the first one to admit it. Um, but doing nothing yeah. is um. In, in at least in my view, unthinkable, because um, you leave it, everything to odds. You know, you, you give you give away the house, uh, uh, to yeah. sort of say. Well, this is so great because um, just before yes, so the carbon markets, the high integrity principles. You've heard of that? Mm -hmm. that apparently, UNDP is championing. I, I'm just now getting uh, you know briefed about this. Okay. But, yeah, this is the kind of um, yeah things that I'm gonna be. So yeah, what are the priorities for the COP for Indigenous peoples? Um, yeah, yeah, and, and the, yeah. Um, at least that's on Article Article Six uh, on carbon markets. Um, yeah. There are a lot more processes ongoing. Uh, loss and damage is still ongoing. Um, um, mm -hmm. Coronovia, so our, our agriculture is still ongoing. The platform is still ongoing because um, yeah, like we're we're coming to the end of the first. 
uh, work work plan of the platform. And like in a year, next year will be a review year, and then we have to go back into negotiations again for oh. a second work plan. And yeah. yeah, and you don't know like if a country could say, like, you know what, you weren't effective in two thousand twenty, so um, let's let's just call it call it a day and and not do anything anymore. Mm. So that, that I'm not saying that that is. Um, that that will happen, but it is a it is a possibility. Um, mm -hmm. So it is um, it, it is there's a lot of moving, and that, that's why I love COP actually because there's a, a lot of moving um, um, processes, moving targets. Uh, yeah. you, you always have to, you have to, always have to be uh, like it. It's two weeks, but it's it's super and it's super intense. Yeah, um, but it's it's uh, it's an environment that I strangely strangely enough I love to be in. Yeah, um, it's so, uh, it's so exciting! So much energy and the possibility, oh, yeah. and the mm -hmm. conversations, and uh, you know what happens in the corridors, just as important, if not even more important. Yeah, so, so it is um, like yeah, Permaform is uh, and 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 it, it is important, but you, you yeah you already yeah it, it is it comes down to presenting statements and trying to make sure that it's in the report. Right. Um, also important, obviously. Right, uh, but you can see, like in at cops, like you can see directly the fruits of your labor. Um, as in, like, y yeah, you know, um, it, it is it is an end form. Like it is a lot of moving targets, a lot of things. It, it requires a lot of coordination uh, amongst mm -hmm. Indigenous peoples, and I, I, I love the how we, as a caucus, handled ourselves mm -hmm. in 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 a in a almost uncontrolled chaos. It's called cop. Yeah. Uh, by um, all right, hey, I heard this from this country. I had bilateral with this one, and it all comes down to one. Uh, yeah, like it, go, it comes comes down to one hub of in, like in, we had a, we have an office at COP, and then it is up to us to like all right to to identify the signal from the noise, right? Right, like so. so what what is um what is helpful? What 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 could be um yes yeah, so, uh, um. Uh, and at what level is that person at and saying those words or, or whatever so like you, you get to um you should you should you should go to cop uh, or something and maybe i'm gonna do a live stream at some point i don't know and when, when we're a cop because um what we usually do what i uh, what we usually do is have a, a big map uh, like a mm -hmm. big big uh yeah a big piece of paper on 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 a wall um and we we draw it out All right like this is what we need Th these are the groups strategy. and then we strategy. yeah it's 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 strategizing like it, it's um it is it is the mapping exercise you know it, like going back to the drone thing you know like has a thirty thousand feet view it's super right. important it's especially true. when you're indigenous peoples and you're you're out outnumbered not outgunned but you're outnumbered right. Right. so right. you have to be very strategic with um with the punches that you make Sorry. so um yeah like it is it is um it is so we had a um yeah it, especially is it the youth crew actually the dad actually uh, um because they're there to learn right, uh, right. So like, all right how do you do this like is, is it really walking up to a state and saying oh we demand this and this and this and the first thing i say that's not it it is about like knowing the playing field not, not like see the whole board and knowing which um, which chess piece to move, like, right. and you don't you don't push one lever all the way down. You do it a little bit, and the other one a little bit, and the other one a little bit, and all contributes right. to 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 a certain uh, to a certain motion actually that you want um, uh, countries to move to to move in. You know? So they, they drew, drew it all out, and so I, I went away for 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 I had a meeting, probably negotiations, and went back, and the whole wall was plastered with. All right, these are the countries. This is the information that we received, and they they briefed me yeah. on all right. This this this, this right. is what we see, and then like and then it was like all right, what's the play? And then you call a play, and then they're like all right, um, that that this what, what what we'll try to do. So that is um, basically um, indigenous diplomacy, um, Ghazali style in a in a mm -hmm. nutshell <laughs> at the at, at COP. But it, it is it is um, super fun for. Not just for me, but for most, yeah, young indigenous advocates or youth actually, they want to 
um, they want to make an impact. You know, they 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 travel to, they they, they raise money to tr- and travel to Bonn or whatever, and hoping that they can make an impact. So at least, um, yeah, at least of that. Yeah, like, I don't want I don't want them to do to only do actions and protests and everything else. I just also want to show them, all right, this is how you can do it. I'm not saying that this is the way to do it, right? But this is this is a, uh, how I how I know how to do it. It has been successful in 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 in, in recent history. So, um, well, let's let's try it out for Article Six and all the other processes. You know, you, so, I see that uh, I have here at Carbon Markets. We talked about that. Anything on deforestation-free commodities? Blah, 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 uh, in, in, I would have to re- read the um, uh, um. Our position paper again um, okay. uh, for, for that. Um, when it's come to carbon markets, it is, um, yeah, I think Article Six. I can't remember that Article Six made, made any any reference to deforestation and everything else. Well, what, what you what you just mentioned? Shareable. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'd love I'll, to. Yeah, and then we can have a conversation based on that because really the goal is to, I I have to help insert. Indigenous people's priorities into whatever's being planned for okay. the IDF global platform towards COP26. And so everyone's looking to me to, you know, f- represent, uh, put in those, uh, you know, mm. positions yeah. that you guys have. So I want to know them so that we can fight for them. <laughs> that, w- that would be super helpful. And I, and I think I, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking of, because we're not doing that enough um, as Indigenous peoples coordinate. Um, doing like online gathering of like right of, of processes because yes. I'm focused on Article Six, but there are other people are focused on other processes. Right. So, um, uh, um, in a way that, for example, that you could come in, for example, and, and it's like, all right, hey, this is what we're doing over here. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd love to present on the NYDF yeah. goals because really, you know, you there's 22 indigenous people's organizations networks that have endorsed but we also want to go beyond just the endorsers and make sure that this is you know germany like one of the the big fun the the funders of the global platform you know wants to make sure that you know the forest agenda right is is just as powerful as ever and and so there's going to be much more renewed energy behind the new york declaration of forests mm-hmm. um and they you know there's the ambition to use it as like a high level platform to make announcements by like countries like uh, you know uh, germany norway the us um on forest action Mm -hmm. yeah so we just want to make sure that my job is to make sure that the voice of indigenous peoples is included there as well so please give me everything you know give me your priorities so that we can (laughs) then my idea of a platform really yeah yeah it's it's such it's such a um for, for, for forget well I will 100 do that um um because I think I think it's as we're gearing up for cop 26 and I'll go through the co-chairs and ask them to, to schedule schedule a meeting or if not then I'll schedule one um I don't see mm-hmm. I don't have a problem doing that <laughs> um but like it's it's um j- just a word of appreciation for what you do um um not just for UNDP mm-hmm. but in general in support of indigenous peoples um mm-hmm. that um it is i'm i always find it very necessary um to um acknowledge when acknowledgement is due mm-hmm. um whereas we always look at like the people that are um uh like the, the leadership uh, people right um mm-hmm. but um i think that um the people behind the scenes that do the hard work actually um 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 yeah deserve um proper acknowledgement of, of their uh of the work and dedication and you you didn't you've been doing this for for, for a very long time <laughs> um and yeah like like it is you, you can you can see that you have a certain drive in you um for, to, to to keep on doing that while well, police police are there and now it's on know, your side not for me uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> They're not for me though. So yeah, that doesn't get there. Go. <laughs> yeah. No, but it is um that so yeah, it um I think is I, f- I find it super important, especially um in these times today, uh, where um 
trust by indigenous peoples into um because i can it's like it's almost at first it was an intuition but now I can, I can i can see it almost is that like the trust of indigenous peoples um in non-indigenous peoples is like it's like like slightly declining a little bit mm -hmm. um that it is super important to um yeah to to acknowledge the people the 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 and i don't like to call it non-indigenous peoples because it's mm -hmm. makes it so inside outside kind of thing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's why I always call them allies. You know, you're you're allies, right, yeah, yeah, allies, allies. <laughs> like that. Um, that um, yeah, it's, it's super important to uh, to acknowledge the allies that have been there through through thick and thin, and um, that yeah, I don't know. It, it's Thank um, you so much. You're really, it's it's an honor. It's an absolute honor. What what is what is the um, you, the drive? Like, what drives you to? Mm -hmm. To keep on doing what you do uh this is a story that i thought like i would start this conversation with and i was just looking at the time because i have a call at 3 30. um okay, yeah. so i'm sorry we have no, that's know, okay. i have to go but well you know my great-grandmother her name was maria was the healer in our village so i spent half my time in our hometown and then the other half in a small village uh, in rural bulgaria she was the healer in the village, and so people would come to her, and she had knowledge. She knew how to use plants. She knew how to use different healing modalities um, to help people. And I grew up around her, and she was my favorite, favorite person. I just loved her so, so much, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working – when I started working the Equator Initiative, uh, you know, it was, like, broadly with local communities. But I didn't have, like, a focus on indigenous peoples exactly, you know. I went to Brazil. I, I was working there. I had to create the community dialogue space for the Equator Prize winners as part of the the COP, the CBD COP, the Conventional mm -hmm. Political Diversity Co Conference of Parties back in 2006. So I lived in Brazil for four months doing that. And that's when I, I met Marcos Terena, who you know. Yeah. And the rest is history. It's the, He helped me. Um, make the whole project happen and really kind of took me under his wing and, and like mentored me in just sort of navigating and learning about indigenous peoples. I met um, the people that, you know, he brought some uh, shamans there and some people from different tribes around Brazil to work on building a, a, a village for indigenous presence. And, and I met them, and you know what? I, I became friends with one Shavante uh, healer there, uh, Matias, and he reminded me of my great-grandmother. Mm. You know, it, it immediately, I had this uh, sense of familiarity, and so it reminded me of home, you know, a place that I was really missing. So I found that place inside me communicating um, with, with him, and it was just like a sense of acceptance and a sense of of of, of community and closeness and um, and and a lack of um, kind of pretense and barriers, you know. So, and it's and it's the knowledge. So it's something about the energy that indigenous peoples and the knowledge. It, it, for me, it comes from the traditional knowledge. And I really believe. I mean, it's a very selfish thing. Like we need it to survive. The mm. world needs it to survive. So that's really where my drive is from, and I and I and I want um, that you know indigenous peoples' ways and culture and that diversity and that vision that you've held for for centuries that that some of us have given up or it has been taken away from us. You know, um, it's kind of like that's where my hope is. You know, mm. for the world. That's and um, yeah, a natural start of a conversation but i think um it's a, a good end of of this conversation as well yeah. as in it, it encapsulates everything like why you do what you do yeah you yeah know, and it's um i just yeah looking forward to um continue working with you uh we've got some great things coming up uh, we had a meeting about that yesterday yeah, um, I, I do um, want to have. Yeah, let's. If 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 okay with your schedule, I'd love to have a meeting like next week to talk about Cap Twenty Six. How yeah. we can be helpful. How I can be helpful to you and to the caucus and the LCIPP and to understand better the positions that you are 
uh, fighting for in COP26. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll definitely, if it's okay if, if I bring in other people as well, because oh, please, I mean, yeah, I, please, please, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can only yeah. talk about Article 6, but I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of other things that I don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm absolutely. not good at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah. let's yeah, lovely. Let's I'll I'll um I'll I'll check in with with them and we'll schedule a meeting. Yes. Uh, somewhere next week. Terrific. Um, yeah. yeah. Nina, thank you so much for 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 this conversation. Um um uh, for it's everything that you do that you did uh, going to do and hopefully we can do this uh, in person and yeah. you can show me how to fly a drone. Yes. I love to, I love I to learn wait. how to fly a drone. I can't wait and thank you so much for inviting me and for this lovely conversation. I can't wait to keep getting to know you and keep working together and thank oh. you so much yeah for being 100% likewise. Yeah. All right, thank you so much and have, have a great day. Bye. Bye. You too.